Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us today. We're at Cumulo's office in Seattle, Washington, and one of the things we want to talk about is the architecture. Joining me to help me with that is Eric Scholard. He is the VP of Sales for Cumulo. Eric, thanks for joining us. Today. Hi, nice to meet you. So, uh, why don't you take us through the architecture a little bit and tell us what makes uh, Cumulo so special? Great. So, the customers that Cumulo's product is designed to uh, serve are customers who have uh, requirements to store massive amounts of file data. So scalability and simplicity and resiliency are, are at the top of the kind of the design of, of the architecture. And you're dealing with customers that are in the hundreds of terabytes, typically going into the petabytes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean hundreds going to petabytes to tens of petabytes actually. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and so we take a cue from how the hyperscale platform vendors make big, fast, reliable um, compute environments uh, when we designed our, our, our scalable storage architecture as well. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll take us through the architecture. Yeah. So uh, Cumulo's architecture is all about nodes. Nodes make clusters. Okay. Uh, and when you have nodes, all of the nodes in the cluster are exactly the same. Okay. And you start with exactly four nodes and any number of nodes greater than four can make a cluster. And it's a cluster. Okay. So uh, the great thing that Cumulo does though is no matter how many nodes there are in the cluster, our file system, which is really what the, the interesting part of the, the business is, sure. makes all of those nodes look to the users and to the applications as a single file system, regardless of how many of them there are. Okay, so I'm essentially dealing with a global namespace. Absolutely. Okay. It's a fully symmetric architecture, it's fully resilient, and it's, uh, it's absolutely modern in its approach. Okay, and I noticed on the, at least the one node you got filled in here, you've got both SSD and H HDDs, do you guys manage that automatically? Yeah, yeah. So all of our nodes uh, are, are hybrid. Okay. Um, an exception is we do make a particular all flash node, but what we've tried to do is to deliver uh, you know, high performance storage uh, at archive prices. Gotcha. And the way that works is that you take all of the nodes in the cluster, they're a single namespace, a single file system. And so when somebody wants to connect to the, Q to the Cumulo cluster, they connect using industry standard uh, Ethernet switches, 10, 25, 40, 100 gig switches. They connect with the, the cluster using industry standard protocols, NFS, SIFS, or SMB rather. Uh, so no, there's no client software to load nope. locally? Okay. No, there's no, there's no client side drivers, there's no proprietary software. And so what happens is when uh, a user wants to access or wants to write a file to the cluster, uh, what they do is they, they connect to one of the nodes in the cluster. It's usually handled by some you know, sort of a round robin process. And here's what happens is very interesting, is the write always lands on SSD. Okay. And as soon as that file is written to SSD, a bunch of things all happen at once. Okay. First, all of the metadata about that file is extracted and pinned on SSD. Okay. So we can get really, really fast performance for a whole bunch of the housekeeping tasks that file systems need to do. Well, and, and so much of I.O. is metadata, right? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And at scale, that's what kills most traditional file systems. When you're dealing with millions of files spread, or even billions of files spread across many, many directories, across many, many nodes, when you get to that scale, traditional file systems just just break. Yeah. And, and so by extracting that metadata, putting on an SSD, when we need to understand something about the file system, how many files there are, do a lookup, curate data, figure out what's okay to delete. We're querying a metadata index on SSD instead of walking the tree, which is the Achilles heel of other, other files. And that really can't be overstated. I mean, we, we've seen many, many sites where you have essentially half full NASs because, and it's not because they ran out of capacity, it's because they, they couldn't handle any more metadata. That's exactly right. Yeah, makes and, sense. and that really becomes a bigger problem when you've got lots and lots of small files as right. well. So what happens is data is written to SSD, we extract metadata, pin it, and then what happens is all of the files are striped across all the nodes in the cluster. Okay. And that means uh, a couple of really important things. One, it means that any file can also read, any user can read that file from any node. Okay. So you get really amazing uh, concurrent access to data. Okay. Uh, and it also means that you've got tremendous resiliency. So that if you lose a node, a drive, combinations of nodes and drives, you never lose access to that data. So these files are segmented in some way and yeah. scattered across the drive. Uh, we have a really efficient layout. We use erasure coding. We've got the best stripe widths in the industry. Uh, and we very efficiently lay out uh, data on physical storage resources. Okay. So it, this this obviously is an on-prem situation. Uh, you know, we had a lot of IT professionals that we talk to that are kind of dealing with the cloud and wrestling. Should they do it? How do they do it? Things like that. Mm -hmm. What's your guys' answer to that? Well, so 
we feel like uh, the same approach that customers take to file on-prem should be available to them uh, in the cloud. Okay. And unlike a lot of storage vendors that sort of look at the cloud uh, as a tape drive where you put old data that you don't use very often, yep. we think that what customers really want is to be able to have the same kind of tier one uh, file uh, services experience uh, in the cloud that they have on-prem. Sure. And so for us, what that means is that if you're in AWS or GCP or very soon Azure, this same architecture that you have here on-prem, nodes that make clusters, is the same thing you do uh, in the cloud. So using a combination of EC2 instances with elastic block store underneath, you make a four node Cumulo cluster, and now you've got the exact same file system look and feel that you had on-prem in the cloud, and you can replicate that data freely back and forth. So you can burst to cloud for hybrid workloads. You can use it for continuity. Uh, you can do all the things that you could do on-prem with file in the cloud. And many of our customers use both sort of interchangeably. So, and, and the replication software that you would use to do to on-premise uh, DR situation, you're just doing that into the cloud now. Exactly, so in, a, in another situation, you might have you know a second you know, you know, Cumulo cluster on-prem, it's the same experience. We think that the users shouldn't even necessarily know that the files that they're accessing are being served by physical uh, hardware on-prem or a virtual environment in, in the public cloud. Gotcha. All right, and then, so from a um, back and forth standpoint, this just becomes an automatic transfer between yeah. the two. Policy-based replication, asynchronous, lots of policies around what to do and when to do it and schedules and, and all the rest. It's it's a totally modern experience. So, and one of the things I was really glad to have you on the light board is you're out there sort of on the front lines and, and one of the things that we've seen a lot uh, really from your guys' inception was this concept of the built-in analytics. How, how, how does that resonate with customers? Uh, it's, it's one of the biggest differentiators out there. Okay. In fact, if you think about kind of the first wave of scale-out storage solutions, they sort of solved the problem of making a large bucket into which you could pour lots of data. Yeah. But as it is, uh, with many things, when you solve one problem, you create the next one. Sure. And the next problem was, what's in the bucket? Right. And the problem that all other file systems have is that to answer that question, remember the thing we said about tree walks? Yes. It totally defeats their ability to help customers understand what's happening with their data. Yeah. So going back to this idea of pinning the metadata on SSD, it gives us analytics capabilities that really accrue to two big audiences. One, the storage practitioners who have to uh, manage very large scale storage environments, troubleshoot performance issues, figure out what, can, you know, what data can be deleted or what's old, all the kinds of typical housekeeping things that you would see uh, a storage administrator need to do at scale. Right. The second kind of big constituent for the analytics uh, are the business stakeholders, the people that want to do things like capacity planning, the kind of things that they want to do around showbacks and chargebacks and, and all the kinds of um, business level information about storage at scale that they just can't get with these older file system products that just have to walk that tree or do these file system scans. It just completely defeats their ability to, to do that. Okay, that's great. So Eric, one of the things that you know we had talked about earlier was this concept of these half full NASs out mm -hmm. there. I explain how you guys are getting that efficiency. Yeah, so this is, this is a huge difference, especially when you're dealing at multi-petabyte scale. Mm -hmm. There's always been a problem in the storage industry that a customer buys five petabytes of physical storage, right. and then they find out that they're out of space when they've only used three petabytes of it. Yeah. And they're essentially throwing away two petabytes of capacity that they're paying for. Well, and when you're dealing with numbers like petabytes, throwing away half of it gets really expensive. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it, it, at, at terabyte scale, it's annoying. At yeah. petabyte scale, it's a massive problem. It's a painful thing, yeah. And so because of the way that Cumulo lays out uh, data on the physical media, whether it's SSDs or spinning disks, uh, we get a few really powerful capabilities. First of all, as I said, we use erasure coding for data protection. Mm -hmm. We get the most efficient stripe widths in the industry, which means that you know the greatest percentage of raw capacity to usable is available to Cumulo. Gotcha. But the real difference has come in, in the next two areas, which is that unlike other file systems, that when you start to get close to full, you've seen this before, you get to 75% full, 80% full, that file system starts to slow down. Yeah, it starts to get hard to, you know, fail, you know, when you fail a drive, the rebuilds start to get really bad. Yep. Uh, and a bunch of weird things happen. And so most storage vendors say, once you get to 80, stop writing data to the cluster right. and add more capacity. Yeah. Not so with Cumulo. What we say is if you've got four petabytes of usable capacity after data protection, all the rest, you write that all the way to the top and you don't see the kinds of performance degradations, 
extended rebuild times and some of the rest. And so what we really feel like we're doing is giving customers what they pay for. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and if they do need to add capacity, it's really, really simple. Right. You just take another node, you rack it, you connect it to the same switch, and then you tell the cluster to look for a new node, tell the node to join the cluster. It's literally 30 seconds, and that file system will automatically expand to include the new capacity. The users uh, and applications don't even know that it happened. It happens without interruption. It's a totally seamless experience. And is capacity rebalanced in the background? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So then all those files that were striped across, in this case, four nodes, get rebalanced across five nodes. But again, big difference here, uh, where with other file systems, it might take, we've had customer cells that takes days sometimes to rebalance those file systems. Mm -hmm. Again, because we have all the metadata available to us immediately, we rebalance those clusters in you know an hour or two. Wow. Totally okay. different experience. And, and, and there's one more thing on, on the efficiency, because you said you had three things. Well, the, th the third thing is um, file sizes. Okay. So uh, some file systems, when the files get really small, like sub 128K files, they actually, instead of using like parity protection schemes, have to mirror, and in some cases, triple mirror uh, the protection. So that's a double hit. Right. You lose a bunch of uh, capacity f you know, on data protection. Right. Then you can only fill it up to whatever, 75, 80%, and then you're throwing away another 20 points just because the file system inefficiently handles small files. Right. We have a customer where they uh, did a side-by-side -side data migration of you know, the old file system to Cumulo, uh, and they found that that it was only in this case about a 500 terabyte environment mm -hmm. took 380 terabytes on Cumulo. Exact same data, wow. exact same file count. Huh. That's 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 huge. And again, at petabyte scale, that really starts to add up. Absolutely, right? yeah. yeah. Okay. So Eric, before we wrap up uh, here today, uh, let's do two things. One, I want to get your take on sort of Cumulo from a historical standpoint, where you guys are going. Yep. And then I we got to explain what this thing is doing in our video. So All right. let's start there. Okay. So so this is our company mascot. He's the Grumpquat. Okay. And anybody that spends any time around Cumulo, a company whose name starts with the letter Q, will find all these puns littered throughout the organization. Our, our customer success uh, team is called Mission Q. Mm -hmm. It's in Houston, we have a problem. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, the Grumpquat, we needed a mascot. There's only one fruit that starts with the letter Q. Okay. A, a kumquat, or it has the letter Q in it, a kumquat. Uh, and he's the Grumpquat because uh, he's never satisfied. Okay. He always wants us to do more. Okay, well, yep. there you go. Yep. Uh, and then a little bit of background on uh, Cumulo. Yeah, so Cumulo, uh, we were founded seven years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we really founded this company from the beginning uh, to try and solve some of the unmet challenges of legacy storage products. We like to say we're a different kind of storage company built for the modern era. Uh, we released our first products to the market in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, and since then we've been growing uh, at a really rapid pace, uh, and we do business now in North America, EMEA, uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, and we're really, really excited that uh, last fall in the most recent analyst reports that come out, you'll see Cumulo prominently positioned as a, as a leader, uh, according to some of the leading industry analysts that are out there. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, Eric. Appreciate you it. You Thanks, yeah. George. I'm George Crump, lead analyst of Storage Switzerland.